he put the, this like a high electricity on the, the wire fences of the entire border, put the machine guns with the guards every 10 meters. And then on top of that, he buried landmines on the entire border. So entire country became a concentration camp. So last year, only two people escaped to South Korea. In the and whole in year, the, the entirety of the year, two people made it out. Yeonmi Park, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Chris. Looking back now, does it feel like a dream when you think about your time living in North Korea? Totally. <laughs> you know, uh, when I was watching this movie called Inception, right, there's a very confusing part. You don't know what is dream anymore. And so when I dream, interestingly enough, I am still in North Korea. And this is the one thing that or that North Koreans share. After they even escape, when they dream, they are still in North Korea. So when we wake up, we still think we are in North Korea. Sometimes we have to like remind each other it's not. And so I learned like how to pinch myself. That's why I heard like if you pinch and if it's painful, that's like you know it's a reality. And so I do pinch myself a lot, many, many days. What were you dreaming about when you were in North Korea? The themes are very similar, right? Like always how do we find food, you know, begging the neighbors, going around town, and also thinking about escape. How are we going to escape? There's a flood happening in the summertime. The guards is watching and always looking for ways to survive. It's never about like chill and having a happy moment. Or sometimes like I go back to North Korea and my neighbors are recognizing me that I'm the enemy and they try to punish me. So always like that kind of dream, like running away, you know. Isn't it weird that while you were there, you were dreaming of being away and while yeah. you're here, you're now dreaming of being back. It's kind of like you can never leave in a way. No, I don't think it's possible. Yeah. I don't know what it is, but... All North Koreans have that same theme. I ask every North Korean that I meet, and they all say the same thing. So something about it, I don't know why. I can, I don't know what other decisions do, like the people who escape Cuba or Venezuela, if they do the same thing. But at least when it comes to North Koreans, we somehow not able to live our, you know, North Korea in our dreams. What's the closest that you've been back to North Korea? Have you been to the DMZ? I have not been to the DMZ, but I've been to very close North Korea doing the balloon launches. I don't know if you heard about it. There are NGOs that we uh, use balloons and sending leaflets to North Korea, and it pops it in the North Korean sky. So inside the leaflets, we have, you know, like, you know, talking about how Kims are dictators. So during those balloon launch, we had to go really near the border Where are from you? North Korea. In South Korea, from South Korea. Okay, to yeah. Do that. And then you mm. just put them up, let the wind carry them over, and they pop and yeah. release pamphlets yep. everywhere. Yeah, exactly. What do you think is the likelihood of people in North Korea believing what you've sent over? Because the brainwashing is pretty strong, and mm. it seems almost unfalsifiable that if you were to get these sort of leaflets mm. flown over, it's an easy excuse to say this is just more propaganda from the West. This is America mm. proving that they are our enemies. They're trying to brainwash you away from us. They do that. And I think in the past, uh, North Korea regime would like circulate these rumors. If you pick up a leaflet or something, it's gonna, you know, it's gonna, your skin gonna fall off. Whereas you're gonna become a deaf, or you're like tongue is gonna lose. Never pick up something that was like, you know, coming from other country. However, you know, people are so desperate, so they, they eat whatever. So we didn't eat, like, leaflets. We put, like, $1 USD. And we also put some, you know, chocolate pies. I don't know what you need. Know. That's, like, a light, you know, snacks. So they also pick them up and eat them. And, and then they realize, okay, we don't die. But, of course, if you're caught and doing it, somebody says that you're going to be death sentenced or sent to concentration camp. And I met a lot of stereo defectors who were listening to and picking up these leaflets and learned about the truth and escaped. So I think I'm sure, I'm sure there are some people do not believe it, but there's still quite some people do change their, their mind and eventually escape. 
What's a typical day in a North Korean person's life like? That is a good question because you know North Korean lives are very so in America. Even I was thinking about thinking about the president, right? The life of Joe Biden and the some peasant life in America, the farmer's life, wouldn't be that different. Think about it. When they wake up, they're gonna have a shower. They have a running water. They have running electricity. They have TV. They have running refrigerator. They have breakfast, lunch, dinner, right? So even if you are like the trillionaire, life isn't that different compared to somebody in the bottom, right? Even our homeless people here can like eat and drink. But in North Korea, interestingly enough, they made it. Uh, they have a caste system. It is like very like ironic. It's like socialist paradise. Nobody should be like everybody should be equal. But they initially they started the country as making everybody equal. But they made it to big three categories of caste system. Then within three categories, they are dividing into fifty different categories. So depending on what status your caste you are in, your life is vastly different. So, like my case, I was born a middle class, where my father was a party member. But still, middle class means in North Korea, you don't have running water, you don't even know what shower is, you don't even like have the 24 hours electricity, you don't have cars, public transportation. You your days are always planned by the party. I remember one thing I shocked me when I went to South Korea. Someone gifted me this notebook. And that was a planner, so I never seen a planner in my life. So what do you do with this? Like, oh, it's easy. Just like you want you gonna do with this day, this month. You plan your year ahead. And in North Korea, you can never plan your day. That is not even concept for us because we don't own ourselves. In the the day before or the week before, we have somebody like the leader in the family, the town. Everybody gotta be associated something in North Korea. And they give us our week's schedule. So what would that look like? What would what would that schedule look like? So it usually begins with the labor. So it doesn't pay you, but we all revolutionaries. We gotta fight for the revolution of the country, right? Even your kids, there's no such a concept of minor in North Korea or elder. So even if you're like five years old, you gotta work. So they basically they say, oh, school kids this morning get up at five a.m. We go to some collective farm. Or we go to railroad and break in the rocks, or we go to dam and we work for the you know the construction workers. So from 5 a.m. we work until 8 a.m. Then sometimes they ask us to bring us our breakfast or go home to eat breakfast, and then we go home to eat breakfast. Then we have to go to school afterwards. Then when we go to school, we spend three hours learning about the revolution history and the greatness of our dear leader and how amazing they are. After the brainwashing is done, they say, "Okay, go to get lunch or bring your lunch with you." But a lot of kids cannot afford to eat, so they don't eat lunch. Then after lunch ends, they take us to the farm again, to collective farm or the factory or the construction work zone. But this thing is same thing with the adults and the kids. We all have to work. So entire afternoon we spend on working, and then we work helping the farmers with their harvest. When the thing ends. We they do let us go to have dinner, and then sometimes they don't end the labor until 10 p.m. or 11 p.m. Then when that ends, we go home and eat dinner, and then you sleep. But that same schedule repeats next day. We wake up at 5 a.m. And North Korea has this radio that that regime gives it for free, right? Everybody have to get a radio, but of course it's like all about brainwashing you. And that also radio tells you when to have dinner, when to have lunch, when to get up. Like everything is collectivism. You cannot choose like set up your own alarm. Like I'm gonna get up like ten today, like nine today. Everybody have to work with the same schedule. So that's the life of someone that was middle class. What about upper class? I don't even know. <laughs> But because the thing is that in America, the I guess like mainly there's a middle class, then some in the bottom and top, right? But most of people still have like somewhere in between the middle, lower middle, middle and higher middle. But in North Korea, most of people in the poverty line, like 90% of all of them are poverty. 
and within 10%, that's like a middle class. But then within that 10%, there's like one top percent is like really small percentage of population who are privileged. So they do, of course, have bands. They, all these guys have their own pleasure squad. They have, What's you a know, pleasure squad? It's the girls uh, they pick up around the country, pick up all the virgin girls who have good family status, and they train them from when they're kids. And then when they become 16 or 17 years old, they take them to the Pyongyang capital. Then they train them to be masseuse, dancer, satisfaction group is like sexual pleasure group. Uh, they divide in different like groups. Then uh, there is a pleasure squad for the Kim, Kim Jong-un, the second power, the top elite guys all have these groups. Every year they get a new group to please them. So their lifestyle is like unimaginable. They have private island, they have a yacht, they go to even study Switzerland. Right? I mean, Kim Jong-un went to school in Switzerland. So the top elite life is like unimaginable life that then even better than the U.S. president's like life in some ways. How is this enforced? How do you enforce such a rigid class system? You, well, I mean, in the beginning, North Korea started as a communist, right? Kim Il-sung came in and he was the admirer of Lenin and Stalin and Marx. Then he said, okay, we don't like inequality. So why don't we confiscate entire land from people and especially the capitalists? So they were killing the capitalists and getting all the lands from the everybody and nationalize everything. Then they say, okay, nobody owns anything. Now there's no private property. That's how we eliminate inequality, right? Getting rid of everything. After that happened, the, and then Kim's were thinking, okay, we still need a ruling class who knows better, who decides the party's direction. So they call like, initially they call themselves as the servants of the people. So these elites were working for us. And they say, we are the servants for you. And you guys are so grateful. You should be so grateful that we have these people who want to, you know, sacrifice their lives for the revolution of our country. And then they, and then they were deciding collective farms. Everything is collective. We decide who becomes farmer. So the party decides. So in North Korea, when you're born, like your life is determined before even your birth. So when I went South Korea, they were saying like, what do you want to do with your life? I was shocked. You know, when in North Korea, when you're born, depending on what your great, great grandfather did during the Korean War or during the like Japanese colonization, that my status is determined already by the party. And I think that's the biggest difference here is that people can dream your life and design what you want to do. But in North Korea, that's not even like some concept that people understand. And then if you mate between different groups, between different castes, it's on your one-way system, right? If you yeah. mate down, the person that is lower doesn't become upper. It's always the person that's upper becomes lower. So you have a, an increasingly reducing number of people that are at the top and increasingly larger number of people that are at the bottom. Exactly. So that's the thing. Like That's how they prevent mixing between classes. It's the sacrifice so they, that you would have to pay in order yeah. to mix between classes as the higher position would be to sacrifice yeah. your place. Yeah, it's a really like, it's so evil that way. They really prevent people to mix around. So they, I mean, there's no such a thing in North Korea called like marrying up. You only marry down, no matter what. If you marry somebody lower, you go down with them. You can never go up with them. How do people choose their partners then? Let's say that it's not about moving between different classes. Yeah. What does dating look like <laughs> in North so, Korea? So more the average people, the peasants, they are going to be their peasant, right? So they are going to be forever farmers. But in North Korea, farmer means like you're mostly not like we're going to start to death. Like farmers, the regime do the collective harvesting and then they take like 98% of the harvest to the elites. So these entire farmers work in the farm, entire summer and fall and winter, they don't get much food. They get like few grains, few corns a day. So they have to go get the tree barks and to eat the bugs and that's how they survive. So in North Korea, if you become a farmer, 
it's almost like the death sentence to you. It's, uh, it's, there's really no hope of surviving. So I think regime is people, I mean, dating is really like dating with your circle. But in the past, though, like dating is romance is really shameful thing. So regime even the got rid of Mother's Day in 2017 because Kim Jong was so paranoid that the, the people's love for the mother gonna distract their love for the leader and the party. So they deny every other love other than the love for the kings and the party. So people used to be always through like family and Sarah or the party orders. Like these girls who go become a pleasure squad members, they get the order from the regime. It's called like assignment. So they assign who you should marry. And the elites today is all like the regime assigns. So somebody who met kings, right, they become very privileged, then they set up a day for them. So regime literally decides everything for you. You don't have to do anything there, I think. Is there a marriage ceremony? There is. And then the first thing you have to do is when you become a union, you have to go to a statue of kings and pay the respect. And, you know, you got to like have this like a, it's kind of like off that you're going to become a good union to support the socialist revolution. And the way why you marry in North Korea is not about expressing your love or finding your soulmate, but because you want to serve the party better, become a better revolutionary. That's why you're marrying, not for love. So immediately after making vows to another person, what the regime's trying to do is um, redirect that emotion back to the state straight away. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, that's, yeah, that's interesting. You said about the farmers and about the fact that 98% of their produce gets taken away. Yeah. I'm going to guess that a lot of farmers must try to sneak bits of their crops to keep stuff behind. Does that happen? No, then you're going to be kicked and tortured and you're going to send to prison camp. Remember in China during the Mao's uh, five years planning that anybody who got food and got out of the collective thing, they get severely, severely punished. I mean, you don't like this. These people, when we say these officials are not just like normal people. They are like the so evil, cruel, cruel, like torture, like guards almost military guards, in that environment you work. It's a very oppressive environment. It's like everybody's a prisoner in North Korea. So you cannot like dare to steer things. Well, you can literally in the concentration camps, right? The kids are working hard and they raise uh, pigs for the officials to eat. And then they feed these corns to pigs. And when they have feces come out, and there's in between, there's a corn comes out and this, like people inmates eat that. And they, the guards beat them and torture them. Even for, eating, for a, eating the corn that's gone through a pig already? Yeah. So that's how they treat human beings. And so there's no way you can get away. If you get caught, that's the thing. You, you, you get like become handicapped or like sent to camps again. Yeah. So if 98% of the produce is being taken away from the farmers, mm. plus there's a famine amongst most of the population, yeah. do you think that the, there is a bulk of food that's actually being thrown away at the top? Is, it just, is there more food being produced than the people who are allowed to eat the food can eat? So the, here's the thing. North Korea farm really struggles because they cannot even have a fertilizer. So <laughs> as a North Korean kid, we all have to give things to the party. Initially, they promised that we are going to give everything for free to you guys. So give us your liberty, we're going to take care of you. But eventually, they're like, bring everything to us, right? We are the ones that are keeping them alive. So because we don't have fertilizer, literally, we have assignment, bring poop to school and adults. Like in North Korea, there are poop thieves, literally. Because you have assigned to bring a one ton of poop each family or like 200 kilograms per student. So in the winter time, you don't go to school and then they kick you out of this classroom and go look for poop. So because the farmers need a fertilizer and they cannot make the fertilizer. So we need to bring feces that humans make. So and then we bring them to the farmers. 
then that's how you get all those intestines, the worms you get. Like there's a one soldier who got caught and through the DMZ, when he got to South Korea, they were seeing these long, long, long worms in his body. And that is the biggest problem in North Korean people because we are crops that were, the human faces and mixed so that we have so many disease from that. So the farm, farming is not, the harvest is not that great. And there's so much uh, bribery and corruption. So when that happens, and these elites like, take it away for themselves, and they themselves also don't give the entire thing for the, for the party. So it's like North Korea is one of the most corrupt countries in the world. And yeah. How does the prison system work? I mean, is there a prison or is it just forced labor camps and death? So there are three types of prison camps in North Korea. And there's two types of crime too. So one is political crime and second is economic crime. So even you rape somebody or murder somebody. I mean, by the way, rape is not even crime in North Korea. We don't even know what rape is. Like if there's somebody raped, like that girl gets punished, right? They, it's, it's, I mean, men have a pleasure squad. Like we don't even know that sexual harassment is a thing. So, well, that's not even crime. So let's say murder. Murder is even like it's economic uh, crime. Because you've taken a worker away from the party. But then that's, they don't even punish that much because human life doesn't mean much in that country. We don't even know what human rights is. But most severe crime is a political crime. Like let's say your house caught on, caught on fire. You have your children and your mother all like sleeping next to you. But you have a portrait of Kim's. Every household have the portrait of Kim's. So what do you do when the house get caught fire? You don't run with your children on your arms. You have to protect the portrait. Otherwise, the three generations of that family get punished. Or like if there's a newspaper, every newspaper front page you gotta have the photos of Kim's. But when you didn't see that and then you see the back of the paper and you rip it by mistake, that's where you go to political prison camp. And that's a life sentence you never come out. And then you take, take three generations of your family with you. So there are like concentration camps. That is a lifetime sentence. Then there is a... Uh, labor camps that is more like the murderers or uh, thieves or like you know criminals they send that is like a user sentence you come out the last one is a labor camp a uh, forced labor camp that's a uh, more i mean re-education camp those are more like one between three years short amount of sentence and then of course there's public execution for somebody who cannot be redeemed just they're gonna kill them anyway so usually those, if somebody say, oh, I don't believe in the party's like revolution ideology, then that person get executed and the family members usually go to concentration camp and then ne- they never come out. And the North Korea needs this concentration camp like inmates because they need to do a lot of the, the chemical tests. You know, there's gas chambers, but North Korea does a lot of bio, you see, no weapons. So they need, they use it so like inmates and you know, do the, all those tests on them, and then they they have to clean the nuclear debris. So you know, they get deformative and they die from a cancer. So they keep kind of creating these uh, political prisoners to do all this job that they don't want the normal population to be exposed to. Well, it's not just the public executions that are executions. Then there's a lot of other ways that you can be forced to die. Oh, in, yeah. In these different levels of, of prison? Average lifespan when you send to political prison camp is three months. Most of them do not last more than three months. Yeah. So when you go to political prison camp, it's better off to be dying right now. So that's why when defectors escaping myself, uh, we were ready to kill ourselves. We were not going to go send back and be tortured and go to concentration camp and die. That's the most painful misery where you can die you were so certain that you would have gone back and you would have been killed that it's just easier to take your own life instead of suffer it's not just certain it's the north korean regime what they say so if you go to china and then if you were trying to escape to south korea that's that sentence that's a public execution or concentration camp like that's a law so we all know that what the law says so when north korean defectors escape they all like ready to kill themselves can you explain about how the lineage 
from Kim Il Sung sort of through to now has worked mm. because it's quite an interesting story. Yeah, so this is another irony, right? Like in communism, you don't have a king, but North Korea became a kingdom, right? It's a, it's a Kim's, Kim's became not just a king, they became a god for North Koreans. They, so interesting about Kim Il-sung is that the first Kim, his parents were devout Christians. So Kim Il-sung thought, okay, if I copy Bible and tell him, so when you become a god, you don't have to be logical. You don't have to explain why things work the way, right? Like it's, it's a higher power. Like, you know, you don't try to understand God's logic. So it becomes much easier to brainwashing population. So he literally copied the Bible saying, I'm a God. I love you guys so much. So I'm giving you my son, Kim Jong-il, who's going to work for the, you know, the revolution of the country. But his body dies but don't believe that his spirit is with us forever. Therefore, he can read your thoughts and minds and have many hair in your head. Exactly what the Bible says, right? That Jesus came, he died, and his spirit is with us all the time. And that's how I even believe that kings were like reading my thoughts. I was even afraid to think. People in North Korea, the thought crime, that like thinking is not like free. So that's how Kim Il Sung came as a communist. And then he making this country confiscate all the land, nationalize everything. And he was, I think, more dreamer. He really wanted, thought, I think communism would work. I don't know what he thought, but however, when it came to his son, they knew that this thing is for themselves, obviously. And brutally pur purge every time the new king comes. And now Kim Jong Un time, the top officials' lifespan is only three years too. So Kim Jong Un is killing everybody every three years, so they don't get corrupt and then consolidate power, so you cannot start a coup. So when you become a top elite, if you're staying a long time, you are going to consolidate power and get the build allies. But Kim Jong Un execute them and punishing them every three years. By doing that, he get eliminates any competition. Where do you think the paranoia comes from? Is this something that they've been taught by their parents? Have they got a very strong genetic trait for just being unbelievably anxious? What's going on? <laughs> I think they they even know what they're doing is not acceptable, right? Like, I mean, he was killing uh, this top official in a meeting because he was falling asleep in a meeting, and then that guy right next hour get executed in the fire squad. Right, so he knows that people are being loyal to him and people are living in that country, not just because they want to live there, it's just out of fear they are doing it. So I'm sure everybody, he knows that so clearly that he's controlling the people through fear only. Nobody loves him, nobody actually care, take care of him, and nobody wants to be loyal to him on their own. So I think in a way that paranoia is legitimate, but he doesn't have to be that way, right? If he tries to make things really better, and why would anybody not want to be there? It's interesting. It's like a vicious cycle when you mistreat people because as you mistreat them, they have less faith in you, which means that you need to use more force in order to get them to comply, which means that they believe in you less, which means you need to mistreat them more, which means you believe in you less. And you can see how this happens. I um, yeah. get crazy thinking about... This slow descent as well, as you say, it looks sort of 50 years ago like there might have been a genuine dream that this could have worked with some sort yeah. of a balance. What do, you mm -hmm. think, what do you think was the worst period for, to be alive in North Korea over the last, whatever, sort of 60 years or so, 70 years? Worst period, I think, is definitely the 90s after Soviet Union collapse, right? So in the North Korea began in the 50s. After the World War II, the Japan left and the Korea became independent and Korean War begins. And then, of course, America come defend South Korea. So everything departed in 1953. From there on, North Korean economy was heavily subsidized by Soviet Union and China. Because that was a Cold War, they wanted the, the communism to win. So they were like, why even the Soviet Union going bankrupt themselves? 
they're heavily subsidizing North Korean economy. But when they collapsed in 89, uh, North Korea, that's when they really knew that communism doesn't work. You just spend everybody's money and that's it. Everybody become dirty poor, right? So in the 90s, that's when the regime decided that, okay, the only success measure that we are going to have is keeping the 10% of the population alive. That, for them, is a success. So as long as they maintain 10% alive, they think they do not have to do a thing about it. So until the 90% all die, they're going to do a thing about it. So this is why also they want the population to be weak. Why do they starve us, even though the international community begging North Korea to feed its own people? They want to give you money. The UN won't beg you to give you food, right? But North Korea regime says no to the, all the aids and all the medical aids. And the reason why they do that is that because it's so easy to control people when they're hungry. Like in North Koreans, what we do is that when we get up, we eat the breakfast, right? And what we are thinking is, well, how are we going to find lunch? Once you eat lunch, like, oh, how am I going to make, like, find dinner? If you make the one day, you think, okay, I made the one day on earth. How am I going to make tomorrow? You, tomorrow is never guaranteed for you. You don't know like how you're going to be tomorrow. So in that mind, people are very occupied with a survivor. And then, can, then they are not going to even think about what is dictatorship, what is freedom, what is the outside world to look like. They don't care about that. And Kim Jong-un have every, every reason to starve the population. And he's using the most inhumane torture to be a god right now it's very difficult to think about putting a revolution together when all that you need to worry about is your next meal for you and your family yeah it's such a it's such an effective control mechanism obviously it's awfully brutal but it yeah. works it gets the it job works. done of yeah. not permitting any mental freedom for yeah. people to think of those higher abstractions i mean you know for you to think to be surprised by a day planner yeah. What's a day planner? Why would I need to plan my day? That's planned by the state. Yeah. Why didn't Kim Jong Il's eldest son become mm. leader? So Kim Jong Il didn't the Kim Jong Nam who got assassinated, right? So yeah, that's an interesting story. Uh, Kim Jong Il had four wives, official wives, <laughs> and then like how many mistresses? We we don't even know. There's gonna be armies of them. So among those four. Kim Jong Nam is coming from the first wife, the which is a legitimate wife, and he was really loved by Kim Jong Il. Uh, however, around like early 2000, Kim Jong Nam was visiting Japan to go to Disneyland with a fake passport. On the way back, he got caught, and journalists took a photos of him, and then it became an international like embarrassment because North Korea is all about hating the West. Right, hating America, hating Japan, hating the Western civilization. And here is the heir to North Korean throne going to Disneyland. So it was such embarrassment. And that's when Kim Jong, Kim Jong Il were like almost banished him. And that's how he, but the thing is, Kim Jong Nam was a way more free spirit. He wasn't interested in like power. He wasn't interested in control. He was more interested in like opening up the economy. Let's learn from the West. Let's learn like what we can do better. And he was more like a believer of a Chinese direction that the Chinese Communist Party took, which is opening up the economy. We don't have to change the party, Communist Party, but can we at least open the economy so people get fit, fit fed? But of course, North Korean regime like then no, we don't want that. So. His ideology did not meet that what his father dreamed of. And then his third wife, which was also pleasure squad, that she was, I think, a dancer. And she had a son, Kim Jong-un, which was a second son, not even the first son. He was very ambitious. He was very brutal and cruel like his own father. So Kim Jong-il saw Kim Jong-un and then like, oh my God, I see myself in you. So you are going to be the next steel leader, and he became one. So the Kim Jong-nam, I'm trying to keep yeah. up with all of the names here, mm, mm. He, um, he was misaligned to be the sort of leader that everybody needed in any case. Do you yeah. think, because he was killed only a yeah. couple of years ago, he was assassinated, mm. um, yeah. but it seems like 
the trip to Japan was a convenient excuse for somebody that probably didn't meet the criteria to be a leader in any case. Yeah, no, he wasn't going to be that brutal and kill the uncle. Like literally Kim Jong-un is way more brutal than any previous Kims. He used uh, this like aircraft that shoots down the airplane. He used that to execute people. So it makes the people become a dust. Literally, like you become into pieces of just blood and like that's a thing. That's how it executes people and to show the actual terror. And but as you said, right, you gotta use more fear as the time goes by, and more fear and fear, and fear, and there's no ever ending to it. And Kim Jong Un, like literally, when he executes his own uncle, said he has no place to be buried in this land, so make him into dust. That's why he they used the aircraft that gun almost to shoot him down. So he became into pieces and nobody could collect his bodies. Afterwards. What was the uh, what was the outcome? Because he got was it a nerve agent in Singapore or Japan or something? No, Malaysia. Malaysia. Oh, so that was a bro- that was a brother, but the uncle when Kim Jong Un was killing his uncle. But like Kim Jong Nam's case, like the nerve agent that they wrapped in his nose and face, and then he just died within a few minutes. And his body was sent to Pyongyang afterwards, and we don't know what they did with his body, but he was killed in the. And it it was so sad because he was providing information to the U.S. intelligence for the last ten years, and then U.S. didn't do a thing about protecting him. Like he was on that tree meeting a CIA agent in the northern island of Malaysia for two days. After he was giving all the information, and when he was about to go home back to his family, they killed him. And this is so sad. Like nobody protects anybody at this point. Did you hear the story of why the two women that rubbed the rag in his face did it, or yeah. why they said? Yeah. So they claimed that they were. That they'd been told that they were doing a prank on a TV show. Yeah. Is that right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, they they told, oh, this is gonna be some prank TV show. This makes no sense. I mean, these girls were like not touching themselves. The thing they were going washing their hands like very carefully. That I mean, if that was a prank, why would they do that? So, but the thing is, point is that I think even those girls were victims. They were. I don't. I don't really don't think that's so important. They knew or not. The most important thing is how there is no revenge or no accountability. No justice, the, no. You know, even Jamal Khashoggi, the Saudi journalist, we all know that when he got chopped off into pieces in the Saudi council in Turkey, there's no consequences for killing a dissident. That is the world that we are living in. Like, of course, people talk about injustice all, all the time, but this is a clear injustice. These are clear murderers. Well, it's a good and control. It's a great control mechanism, right? If, mm-hmm. as a dissident, you know that not only are you probably going to be killed, but that yeah. the people that are going to kill you aren't going to be brought to account. And the more yes. that this happens, the more that dissidents, killers, aren't put on trial or aren't called to yeah. account for the things that they've done, the more fear it instills in people that want to speak out against regimes yeah. that need it, and the more it mm-hmm. empowers the regimes that want to control the population. Absolutely. I mean, when the when Putin like poisons his distance. I mean, when NBS yeah, Saudis do that, North Koreans does that. Like even there's really no accountability at this point. And this is, uh, I think, one of the justice area that we are struggling. And I think that this is, I don't know how to even solve this. But the thing is, what a joke. The I mean, Saudis and Chinese and Russians deciding who are the human rights violators at the UN. So this is a, almost a joke to me that. Michael you Malice. Joke. Michael Malice will have a solution for this. He's always got yeah. a solution for for mad anarchy law shit yeah. in different countries. All right. So how how does North Korea make its money if it doesn't tax its citizens? Well, I mean they they own us, so they so many ways. So number one is they are the biggest uh, exporter of crystal meth and opium. You're kidding me. They're yeah. the biggest exporter of crystal meth. Mm. Yeah, and the opium. So they in North Korea they cultivate opium in the schoolyards. Literally, every I remember playing with this cutie pretty flower, 
And my mom studied the chemistry in the university, and her colleagues were picked up to go to his labs to making all these drugs to sell, right? So North Korea, 60% of the even teenagers got addicted to these drugs because when you are sick in North Korea, you don't have medicine. Free health care, but I, I had my appendix removed. There is like no anesthesia. They cut bones with anesthesia. So when people get sick, they take the drug to relieve the pain. And that's how they become like when little toddler gets a cold and they don't know what to do, ammonia, ammonia or something, then parents give them like opium to relieve the pain. And we don't even know what this thing is because regime cultivates it, right? We don't have a knowledge of it. So they sell the crystal meth, meth. they export it everywhere to the world. And then they sell a lot of missiles to the Middle East. So all those wars are happening in the Middle East, that all those weapons are sold by the North Koreans selling missiles, weapons, and they were also selling that to the nuclear uh, the strategy, the technology to Iranians, Pakistanians, they're selling those like how to build nuclears for the dictators, right? They had the handbook for that to go for. And not only that, they sell their own people, they sell their workers to Africa. So there's a lot of dictators in Africa. So these North Korean workers go to Africa and, and build statues for the dictators. Because North Koreans are good at building statues, right? That's like what all we got. So all the statues you see of dictators in Africa are built by North Koreans. And then they send the world, they work in Qatar, Poland, in Siberia, in China. And they work as a cutting wood or there's like really going to minor. So would it be if you were chosen to go to one of these other countries, presumably you're going to live under slightly more luxurious circumstances than you're going to No, you're going to be even worse in Poland or in Africa. Absolutely. They build a camp for you. When you go abroad, they build a camp like prison camp and all the banners about the propaganda banners and statues and the portraits of Kim's. And then they are not free to leave that, that, that building or the camp. And there's a vice documentary they did about these people working in Siberia, uh, North Korean workers. They got zero, zero freedom and they work 15 hours a day without any even like safety equipment. And the entire money they make goes to the regime. So their food even quality is so, so they are so like hungry. They are like eating the trash that other people like throw away, but they can't even go out. So there's somebody who's in charge go out and picking up trash food and bring that to them. And even that, of course, North Koreans are grateful. And they go to like Syria even before, I mean, they, they go all around the countries and North Korea and also women. Now it's like a child, they are trying to attract a Chinese tourist to North Korea. And the government runs brothers so they can attract the Chinese tourists to come and have sex with these young girls. And of course, the entire money goes to the regime. And then have these restaurants, right? The North Korean restaurants in China, in a lot of European countries, these girls go and they have to perform and sing and make the food, but they, they cannot leave the building. I was in London mm. last year and... Michael texted me and mm. said, you should really go to this restaurant, yeah. but you can't, you, you don't say anything, don't tell them that I've suggested that you should go, don't mention my name, don't do this, that, and the other. Uh, do you think that might be one of them in London? Is there one in London? I'm not sure about exactly in London. Some of them in other European countries, like Vienna, I heard, and tons of them in China, Russia, in Cambodia, Laos, I mean, Thailand. Uh, really all around the world. Maybe Malice yeah, is like, just trying to get me kidnapped. Maybe, yeah. he's, maybe he's trying to send me somewhere where I'm going to get taken. But they do kidnap people. It's not a joke. They do kidnap people. They have all cameras. And then if they come with somebody they recognize as valuable, they kidnap them. So, yeah. It's, they, because, I mean, North Korea like kidnaps these Japanese citizens. Remember in the past, they kidnap everyone in the world to come to North Korea and then they use them as a training spies and teaching them the language. Yeah. So North Korea kidnaps so many Japanese people and so many people all around the world. 
And not only that, one day Kim Jong Il was like, "Okay, I like sushi, and I like really have good sushi." So what do they do? What do you think they did? Kidnapped a bunch of Japanese sushi rest- chefs <laughs> yeah. and restaurateurs. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> they went to Japan and kidnapped one of the best sushi chefs. <laughs> and then Kim Jong Il one day said, "I really want to make good movies in North Korea." So what would oh, they I do? I remember this. I watched this on the new Netflix series where he kidnapped the, the man and his wife, right? Yeah, the the biggest movie directors in South Korea. Yeah. And they kidnapped them through Hong Kong. So that's, that's okay. They, they kidnap people. It's not a Shit. joke. They were yeah. in if Hong Malice Kong. Is, and... If Malice is trying to stitch me up and get me kidnapped <laughs> through a North Korean restaurant in London, I'm going to be pissed. All right, so <laughs> do you know how many defectors have left North Korea? Have you got any idea? So here's the thing. Uh, nobody knows. That's a clear answer. But we can estimate there are now thirty-three thousand North Korean defectors in South Korea, and then America is only over two hundred defectors, and UK actually got a lot. I'm sure it's like several less than thousand, but still bigger than American community. And there are about up to three hundred thousand North Korean defectors in China, hiding and became a enslaved by Chinese people. So, but then we don't even know how many died along the journey. Like my father died, we never made it. And we knew so many people died in, along the journey. So we don't know how many left and died and made it. But right now, approximately there are 300,000 North Korean defectors in China who are modern day slaves. And very few in the US and some in the UK and South Korea is a major, but the thing is, after Kim Jong Un became in power, he literally, of course, country cannot even afford electricity. He put the, this like high electricity on the the wire fences of the entire border, and that's not even there. Put the machine guns with the guards every ten meters, and then on top of that, he buries landmines on the entire border. So entire country became a concentration camp. So last year, only two people escaped. To South Korea in the and whole the year, the entirety of but, the year, two people made it out. But the thing is, they were not even coming from North Korea. They were coming from the ones who already escaped to China and then escaped. So there's no new escape from coming from North Korea anymore. So the defection kind of stopped at this point. Is the worst place for someone that's North Korean to be after North Korea, China? Yeah, of course. Yeah. It's, I don't know even how to say worse, what's worse, right? Like in North Korea, you, you can die from starvation, but at least with some dignity. You don't get raped, you don't get like sore, you don't get, as long as you don't go to concentration camp, but when North Koreans go there, we, like we become like pigs, they say, even if I kill you, we cannot go to Chinese police, right? Because the Chinese regime gonna catch us and send us back. So, then they say like, they can rape you, they can rip you, and they can take your organs out. Why China is the biggest organ provider? Because, I mean, they, get, they got Xinjiang Uyghurs, they got Falun Gong people, they got Tibetans, they got North Koreans. So North Koreans, when they go to China, uh, if you're unlucky, you go get your organs out and die. Uh, if you, better chances of you surviving in that country is becoming a go-to broker and get raped every single second, or being married to Chinese farmers and who's gonna beat you and torture you. Or like there are towns, like the entire town canal for the women. So they buy one girl and the entire men in the town rape them around. And they, you, this is the 21st century and this is happening right now. And of course the mainstream media do not talk about this because this Chinese Communist Party, nobody wants to, you know, attack them, they wanna, have a business in China. So even Hollywood, all talk about this justice, whatever thing is, they don't want to cover this. Why aren't they covering North Korea? Because China. China sponsors Kim Jong-un and Hollywood gets funding from China. But they need money and they need to sell their movie in China. American corporation, like like even like NBA, LeBron James, look at him what he says, right? John Cena recently. You see the John Cena thing where he did that? Struggle okay. session apology. Oh, shame on humanity. I'm like, this is unbelievable. This is unbelievable. This is the worst regime that exists in this today's world. They run North Korea. They run 
I mean, they genocide the Xinjiang Uyghurs. Their birth rate fell 47% last year because they uh, infertile everybody. They give them a like, the vitamin, why don't you take? Giving them shots, make them that they cannot reproduce. This is genocide. And these Chinese can still be around. And there are so many people say, oh, how about America? America is worse than China, right? It's just, it, it's just such an interesting time to be living in, in, in this country right now. There is no more virtue. There is no more justice, it seems like. It does really feel like there's this huge blind spot. It, I, I understand that commercial interests mean that certain organizations will pay huge prices in order to criticize China. But it, mm. su it surprises me in a world that's so decentralized where you have individual creators that can put things out on YouTube or even blockchain hosted video hosting websites now. You have people with huge, huge platforms that are talking about everything, anything and everything. There is a topic and a, a Reddit thread and a Discord server and a, you know, there's a, a Twitter account for it. It seems so bizarre to me that there's this huge human rights violation going on that nobody's paying any attention to and yet animal rights global warming <laughs> are yeah. these huge movements have you got any idea why culturally it's not being picked up more by people because whatever these twisted people minds they got right whatever thing i mean the thing is, people America especially obsessed with slavery. I mean, it happened, sorry, 18th century. It happened a long time ago. And there are literally people right now being enslaved in this 21st century. So the thing is, if the slavery that matters, that happened like a few centuries ago, why the slavery that's happening right now is not matter to you? And that's the, the biggest hypocrisy is that. If the song slavery matters, why this kind of slavery that doesn't bother you at all, right? This is why it's all about politics. It became almost like identity politics. It's all about their narrative, all about winning their own power. So I think this we are seeing that. I mean, we know that Hitler became voted to come into power. He didn't like start a coup. People voted for him to become on the power. And Venezuela too, right? Even Cuba as well. It wasn't so. Even North Korea, Kim Il Sung too. Like people voted for him. We wanted him. And there is no not, no guarantee it's not gonna happen in the West. It is possible. I mean, it happened with Nazi Germany. So that I think when people lose that what is right, they lose a sense of. I think right now it's like everything, I mean, the biggest problems these kids that have, I saw at Colombia, is the, the, their pronouns. If somebody don't know, do not call their right pronoun, what is cis, whatever this weird word, X, Y, Z, whatever this thing is, this is the biggest oppression they ever feel in their lifetime. And we are raising a generation or brainwashing a generation think that is the biggest problem in the world. And they're keeping them in the bubble. Like they do not understand how rare it is for the individuals to be free. And even know what individualism is. Like in North Korea, there's no word for I. We don't even know the word I. So when I went to South Korea, they were asking me, like, introduce yourself. And this is all North Koreans do. Like, we from North Korea, we from Haitan, we love like this food. And they're like, what do you mean we? Like you, you, I. And in North Korea, that's how they like even get rid of this concept like freedom, human rights, and I. And the fact that we know what I is, that's a privilege. And of course, these people for them is the biggest oppression is that, you know, the pronouns. So yeah, I don't know. I'm I'm are you hopeful? <laughs> Not really, to be honest. Yeah. I mean yeah, no. it it seems like China is such an obvious target for everybody to be concerned about. The militarization of the South China Sea, I watched some documentary about this the other day. That's terrifying. They mm -hmm. are taking over territory in northern Pakistan. They've got this Belt and Road Initiative. They mm -hmm. are exporting more and more technology around the world. They've got disinformation campaigns. And then you see how easy it is 
to socially or culturally hijack countries like the UK or the US with particular yeah. movements. And even now, the skepticism around, is this actually people from the UK or the US talking about this problem online? Or mm -hmm. is this just state actors from Russia or from China that are talking yeah. about this? When you combine all of this, and then what I really would love to educate myself more on is the long-term plans of China. I know obviously there's, there's no booklet somewhere where they've just said, oh, this is what we fancy doing. But obviously the rumors and the obvious impl implication is that they would want to expand the CCP across the entire world. Mm -hmm. And like that's an existential threat. That's a threat to yeah. the entire globe. Yeah. And because companies want to make money and because governments don't want to lose out on import and export duty or don't want to make waves, nobody's talking about it. Like if you leave a problem longer and longer, yeah. it just gets harder and harder to fix. And yeah. I mean, what more obvious of a potential issue could you have than a global pandemic released from perhaps a Wuhan lab? Like, it's just an endless, there's an endless laundry list, an endless laundry list of things that have happened that should yeah. have caused some repercussions for China. There's zero repercussion, right? I mean, they are blaming people saying it's coming from China and they, they call us racist. <laughs> That's what they're spending their energy on, right? It's like, um, I, mean, I mean, it's coming from China. We know that. And China, even if it's not coming from the lab, let's say that, let me move that. It was happening in China. They had to report to the World Organization, be transparent about it, right? We could have ended there if we knew all what it was. They had all the genetic code of COVID and they could, they, that was their duty to report to the World Health Organization, warning everybody what was happening. They didn't do that. They were keep saying, no, it's nothing, it's nothing, nothing. No transmission. No, no, nothing. So even that was enough for them to be held accountable for what they have done to entire humanity. They cared more than two million people around the globe. Imagine Americans did that. Can you imagine? Like if the UK did that, <laughs> the the world is gonna attack us all. If the Chinese does it, oh, of course, like all everybody is defending them right now. Even the people in America is defending them. And this I'm not is sure if anyone's defending them. I think that people are willfully being ignorant to them. I think that people yeah. aren't pointing the finger in the way that they should. Um, but yet, you, I wonder whether the deconstruction of patriotism and of pride in countries like the UK and the USA, it wouldn't... So, I mean, if it's not Russia or China's plan... They must be sitting back and thinking they're just doing our work for us because yeah. the one thing that would work against an aggressive nation state like Russia or China would be a proud country that said, we want to protect our national sovereignty. We're concerned about what's happening over there. And you create an in-group and out-group dynamic, right? You have the out-group that's China. We need to protect ourselves. Perhaps we're stewards of the earth. You know, USA used to be the people, Team USA. I know it's a, a satirical movie, but that, that whole movie was all about them being guardians of the globe. And um, because national pride's been disintegrated a lot, especially over the last two years, no one really wants to stand up for that anymore it's very uncool you've got this fragmented idea about what it means to be an american or a patriot people are embarrassed about their country's history and you think this this is the perfect breeding ground for yeah. an aggressive party to come and take over because no one's going to fight back but that's the thing i think it's, it's not just that it's happened this way at this point i think it's some kind of behind the scene thing have infiltrated this way. I don't think American people chose to be this way and be so ungrateful and so ignorant of the past and the history, right? Like, I mean, slavery began with the dawn of humanity. It's still happening. And still holding the slavery peace in against the entire American nation and saying, this country, only solution to this country is tear down everything and rebuild something, right? That's the thing. These people in the U.S. now voluntarily want to bring down the country, bring down the system, and bring, I mean, 
like get rid of the U.S. Constitution, right? So, but I don't know. That's just began on their own or somebody who were influenced. It, it feels like they've been hijacked somehow, doesn't it? Yeah, it just feels like it's not a conspiracy theory at this point. How the country making that much progress, right? Like from there to here, we have made so much progress as a humanity coming here, but suddenly going against exact that system, allowing this progress to happen, and do not want to kind of going back and what what is this? Everything's reversing. The regression is happening right now voluntarily, and. I don't know what happened, how it is possible. Well, isn't it crazy that you have North Korea, a country with very low living standards where the population is forced to love the country, and yes. America, a country with very high living standards where the population is now hating the country? Yeah. It's exactly. so backward. This is the only country I saw that people hate the country but want to be here. Yeah, how, won't, many won't people, leave. Won't leave, exactly. but, yeah. how many people trying to come to this country? If this is really that bigotry and systemically racist country, the worst country you think is, why everybody trying to come and why would you not even leave? Go away, just go to North Korea. If you want that much, just go to China. Right? Nobody trying to immigrate to North Korea and China. And that's the thing, that proves this is a strictly good, great country. And now saying that becomes very controversial, right? <laughs> what have been some of the repercussions of you defecting? Like, have you ever been threatened or has there been intelligence surveillance ever done on you or anything like that? Well, I mean, where do I even begin? Uh, when I spoke out, uh, South Korea, of course, intelligence informed me that I, um, I'm on the killing list of Kim Jong-un. And Kim Jong-un's killing list is not a joke, right? If he wants to kill somebody, he's not kill somebody. So it was it was good of South Korean intelligence to inform me that, so I appreciate it. But I mean we know that no country gonna protect me. If Kim Jong-un wanna kill me, he's gonna go ahead and do it. And there's of course no precaution for doing that. Uh not only that though, I expected that to happen, but of course because I spoke out everybody that I left behind, the three generations of my family, and even including my neighbors, uh, had to denounce me on YouTube that North Korean show have, the propaganda channel, denounced me that I'm the papa of, of the West, propaganda papa of the West. And this is another bizarre thing about YouTube, is talking about the fake thing and the censoring people. They censor my videos, but they do not censor the video made by the North Korean dictatorship. It is hilarious. So you two can see that video and then all my families are gone afterwards. And I don't know if they've been executed or sent to prison camp. And of course, after that, North Korea had a smear campaign against me, creating, you know, North Korea, another way of their making money is through hacking. Did you hear that? How many Bitcoin they store and how many uh, hackers they raise. So they attacked, even the UK health insurance companies, they have done it. Of course, so they, they do hackers, they create so many smear campaigns against me. So that's what they're good at, the character assassination. So What did that, I was going to say, what, what were the accusations about your character? So it was that I'm a CIA spy, so I get paid from the CIA and saying lies. And then I uh, lied. North Korea has no starvation, it's the best country on earth, and everything is good, but she's trying to become a sensational saying that there's a poverty, there's oppression. And the lying about me is that uh, the worst thing they came up was that I was very individualistic and ambitious as a young girl. So in North Korea, being ambitious and individualistic is like the worst thing can be, right? So on the video, they say she was the poisonous mushroom that grew up in a pile of trash. So she was a young girl, so ambitious and so individualistic. And in the West, like that thing is embraced here. <laughs> and of course, the, the another thing they, they make a problem is that I said I climbed the mountain before my escape to cross the river. But they went to Google Maps and Google, they, they measured the altitude of the mountain, but then the altitude wasn't mountain, it was a high hill. But as a young girl, how do I know? What altitude do you call that hill? Or mountain, I still don't know. Oh, so they used a discrepancy in how yeah. high the hill was versus a mountain to discredit yeah. whether or not 
you lived in the place that you lived. So what was the implication of that, that you were never in North Korea? No, no, no. The thank God North Korea comes up before then. There's, you know, a lot of uh, sympathizers of the, the Communist Party. So they were saying they went to Google Map and checked. And then what she climbed was not here. I mean, it was not a mountain, it was a hill. And then North Korea, then eventually they say, why does she even speak English? She's not like North Korean. She's a fake person, like pretending to be North Korean. But thank God, North Korea really is my birth certificate. <laughs> and they they really released my father's birth certificate. They released my father's sentences to labor camp. And my mom's like entire record. So I am confirmed North Korean, thank God. But the sympathizers are idiots asking me, so what's your passport? Show me your passport. How do I know that you're North Korean? So I'm like, if I have a passport, why would I even escape? <laughs> I would have flew here, right? Why would I even cross the Gobi Desert? <laughs> So this is how dumb the world is. I just cannot even fathom. But thankfully, North Korea confirmed that my name is Yumi Park. I was born in this year, that day. And you're on the kill list. Exactly. So they did way more good to me than bad. Because in America, I I don't know, in the West, people really sympathize North Korea and hate America. And North Korea is the enemy of America. Therefore, they love North Korea. So I became the target from the Marxist, Leninist, Maoist, Communist, and of course, like anti-Western people, everybody. And, and now I'm the enemy of the work. So <laughs> I have a lot of enemies. There's a big yeah. list. You're on everyone's kill list. Well, look, exactly. <laughs> uh, if people want to check out more of your stuff, where should they go? Yeah, they can come to my YouTube channel. It's called The Voice of North Korea. And they can find me on Twitter and Instagram. Not on TikTok, though. (laughs) (laughs) Everything else, yeah. (laughs) You and me, Park, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for coming on. Thank you, Chris. Thank you very much for tuning in. If you enjoyed that, then press here for a selection of the best clips from the podcast over the last few months. And don't forget to subscribe. It makes me very happy indeed. Peace.